Hi, uh, thank you for joining us today uh, for what I'm quite sure will be a, a real treat. And we're very much looking forward to this event. Uh, my name is Richard Reeves. I'm a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution where I direct our Future of the Middle Class initiative, which is the main theme of our discussion today. Um, you're very welcome at joining us from wherever you are. Um, I'm just gonna bri very briefly go through the running order so you know what's coming. Um, and, and then I'll be handing over to one of my colleagues. This event has been inspired by Jean Ludwig, who's the former controller of the currency and who assembled a, a group of uh, economists and scholars to tackle this endemic problem that the US has of the middle class and working class falling behind everybody else. The product of that discussion will be the centerpiece of today's event, but also of a book that uh, Jean has pulled together, published on the 22nd of September on The Vanishing American Dream, hence our title today. A quick plug is that uh, Isabel Sawhill, who you're about to hear from, and myself also have a book on the middle class coming out on the same day, uh, a new contract with the middle class, which is available through the Brookings website. A free hard copy uh, can be ordered. So what Jean did was to gather together some of the best thinkers and policymakers uh, in the field of inequality and to challenge them to think through where's the problem and what are the solutions. And we're going to get a sense of that as we go through our, our discussion today. Please join in. Please send questions via email to events at brookings.edu. If you're on social media, use the hashtag, hashtag vanishing American dream and someone will be funneling those questions through to our moderators during the course of the day. So I want to take a huge thanks to Jean at the outset for really inspiring this strand of work and today's event and my colleague Isabel Sawhill for bringing all of this together. The running order will be that first of all you're going to hear from Bell Sawhill and Jean himself in what we would call a fireside chat in normal times but we'll call a zoom side chat for today and to really dig into some of these themes as to what's gone wrong and what can we do about it. And then there are two expert panels. Uh, the first one moderated by my colleague, Stephanie Aronson here at the Brookings Institution. And that panel will uh, consist of three experts, Jay Shambar, uh, a non-resident here at, at Brookings, uh, Janet Yellen, our distinguished fellow in residence, and Sarah Bloom Raskin, the former um, Deputy Secretary at the Treasury. And then the second panel uh, will be moderated by Bell herself, uh, and that panel uh, includes Jacob Hacker from Yale, Oren Cass, the founder of the new think tank, uh, center-right think tank, American Compass, and the Honorable Deval Patrick, the former governor of the state of Massachusetts. Jean will then offer some concluding thoughts um, to our event. So I don't know uh, what the collective noun for gurus is, um, perhaps a, a galaxy of gurus would do, but certainly that's what's coming. Um, certainly the, um, some of the best minds who've been thinking about these issues are being brought to bear uh, on the event today. So stay tuned, please fire your questions in. Um, do check out uh, Jean's book, The Vanishing American Dream. Uh, and thank you again very much for joining us uh, today. And with that, I'm gonna hand over to the main event uh, led initially by my colleague, Bell Sawhill, uh, alongside Jean. Oh, thank you so much, Richard. I love the idea of a galaxy of gurus. I certainly never heard that phrase before. And as you said, we are here today uh, to discuss some of the ideas in Gene Ludwig's new book on the vanishing American dream. And as you mentioned, the book is an outgrowth of a conference that Gene organized at Yale Law School in which I had the privilege uh, to attend. And I can uh, emphasize what you said, which is that he pulled together an incredibly impressive group of leading scholars, some CEOs and people who have served at the highest levels in federal, state and local government. So the book includes not only Gene's very smart and useful summary at the beginning, but also the actual voices of all the participants only lightly edited so as a reader, you get the flavor, the full flavor of the discussion, including areas where people agreed and also areas where they didn't agree. Uh, before we jump into the discussion of the book and the two panels, uh, I wanna say just a little more about Gene himself. Um, he, he has been a very successful lawyer and business leader. 
Uh, as Richard mentioned, he served as controller of the currency during the Clinton administration. Uh, he has helped, I think, to reform the financial sector, uh, giving a lot of his time to thinking about that, uh, making sure, for example, that banks do not discriminate in their lending practices and encouraging them to invest in community uh, development. But he remains uh, much more than just a uh, financial and business leader. He remains intellectually engaged in a much broader set of issues uh, related to social justice, inequality, and broadly shared prosperity. So with that introduction, Jean, um, I want to ask you uh, what it is, what caused you to decide to organize this conference at Yale, at Yale and to write this uh, book? Well, Belle, uh, before uh, I address your question, I want to say what an honor it is for me to be here today with you and Richard and, and, the, and the Brookings uh, team. Your, your personal scholarship and, and Brookings scholarship uh, is the gold standard around the world, and uh, it is so needed. Uh, uh, but it's particularly needed now. Now, second, our new book, The Vanishing American Dream, it is about a genuine crisis. And, and I don't exaggerate. Uh, this is the central crisis as America lurches into the second decade of the 21st century. The, the crisis is a material decline in the well being of middle and lower income Americans to the point that the American dream, the promise of our forefathers is becoming essentially out of reach for the majority of citizens. Now, the book is important, I think, because it brings together an unusually diverse and talented set of more than 20 scholars, and you and Richard referred to that, the Nobel Prize laureate and, and governors and mayors and business people, uh, treasury secretary, Fed vice chairman, Fed president, you know, you people of different political ethnic, racial, and gender backgrounds who address this question as part uh, of a day and a half symposium at the Yale Law School. Now, as your question implies, I, I came to the book and I, because I came to recognize how deep a problem we have and how it must uh, be tackled, uh, not from uh, economic, financial, or other statistics. In other words, I didn't get the thing because I looked at a bunch of statistics and I said, hey, there's a problem here but rather through personal experience. And, and by the way, I think that's one of the takeaways from the book and the scholarship. The statistics may tell you something, but your, what you feel and touch is enormously important in terms of questioning reality. Now, I grew up in York, Pennsylvania, which when I was growing up in the 1950s and 60s, it was pretty much Norman Rockwell, America. Uh, oh, it had its underbelly of racism and not just against black Americans, but Jews, Catholics, et cetera, et cetera. Those are the times, even in York. But York in those days was a prosperous place of opportunity. Rumor had it, New Yorkers took great delight in this, that no banks closed during the depression. But whether that's true or not, it had a strong farm community. The, I, I, I suggest anybody go to the York Farmers Market, which uh, it was, it was a great thing, it's, I think still exists today. But it also had important indigenous industries, York Dental Supply, where dental tape comes from that we all use, York Air Conditioner that actually invented the air conditioner, York Barbell, the second largest Caterpillar tractor plant in the world, Edgecomb Steel, and I can go on and on. Uh, by the way, I probably use your barbell a little bit myself. <laughs> Should have used it more when I was there. Um, but that was, that's not the York of today. That was the York of yesterday. When, when I went back to give a speech to the business community of the town about five years ago, I hadn't been back in about 20 years to speak of, I was shocked to see a palpable decline in the fiscal, physical and social fabric of the town and the surrounding area. Once lively suburban schools, I'm talking about the suburban schools, not inner city, you know, schools, suburban schools, where the majority of kids uh, today uh, live on assisted lunch. Uh, the businesses I mentioned are all closed and the nationally important business leadership is largely gone. Drug deaths today 
exceed auto accidents for deaths in the county. Now, as I look closer to that reality that I, that I experienced in New York, it, it's representative, uh, as, as many of you all know on the, on the video, uh, of, of America, you know, middle-class America from the Appalachian Mountains pretty much to the co West Coast. Now, even in the Emerald City of Washington, uh, for 43 years, I've walked, ridden my bike, or driven past the Federal Reserve Board. Over the last number of years, a city of homeless people have grown up around the Federal Reserve. It's sprung up and grown, grown, grown. And indeed, uh, I asked my folks- This is right off Constitution Avenue? It's on, it's on H, it's on uh -huh. H on the other side. And I asked my folks to take a look because rumor had it that, oh no, that's not there anymore. I've been out of the city for a couple of months. Oh yes, it's there, just bigger than ever with now a clothesline uh, for people drying their clothes. And yes, right in the nation's capital, right in the center of the Emerald City, next to the Kennedy Center and the Fed. And we all know it's worse elsewhere in Washington. So I, when I thought about it, I said to myself, yes, this is what I feel in touch, but what do the numbers tell us? I, I, you know, I, I care about that. As someone who believes in academic truth, that I know you do, uh, Bell, and, and Brookings certainly does, you know, let's go beyond the anecdotes. So I hired an economic talent to help me dig into the numbers, to better understand the statistics in terms of what is happening in America. And I came to recognize doing that the depth of the problem, that it was really much greater than I'd actually even seen in New York. Uh, and I was genuinely shocked and heartsick. Now, I, I know this will sound a bit bombastic, but if we do not deal with this decline and reverse it, the time will not be too long, uh, no, not too long from now, uh, when the, uh, us cosmopolitan elites uh, will be on the wrong side of the pitchforks. Now, in terms of identifying the problems and the causes and what to do about it, I also recognized I had only one point of view and certain areas of expertise, but by no means comprehensive. And it was important to bring together the exceptional, talented, and diverse group I did to get a definitive handle on what the state of affairs really is and what to do about it. And therefore, the book reflects not just my thoughts, but much more importantly, the thoughts and interaction of the group. So what did we learn? Y yes, everybody agreed pretty much that the problem's as bad as I worried it was. There was pretty much a consensus on that. As to what to do, the symposium was set up and participants agreed there were both national and local issues, both of which had to be addressed. Now the book is full of many ways to attack this multi-headed monster of American decline. I, I urge everybody to read it. Uh, you know, we'll maybe have time here to go into some of the thoughts scholars had, but it's, in, it's incredibly um, detailed and, and diverse in their views, uh, which is actually is more uh, agreement than disagreement. But so that's, that's hopeful. Uh, that's a wonderful introduction. Um, <laughs> Jean, and you did mention both the fact that you have observed yourself and talked to people and gone back to York, Pennsylvania, and really picked up what's going on in the country just for, through observation and the importance of that and not just looking at numbers, but also that we need to combine that with looking at the numbers. Uh, and I couldn't agree with that more. In our own work, we're also doing focus groups around the country uh, with working and middle-class people. Uh, and we also, of course, look at the numbers. I wanna bring up, um, if uh, our staff can help us here, for everyone to see just one chart that was in your book. And by the way, the book has got lots of good charts in it. Uh, it's not just a personal story. And uh, this is a chart that I think a lot of people, a lot of analysts certainly are familiar with. Uh, the data come from the Congressional Budget Office, but the chart is also in Jean's book. And what it shows is uh, the fact that uh, family incomes, household incomes, have been going up rather slowly since about 1980, uh, except at the very top of the distribution where incomes have really gone through the roof. 
Uh, what's particularly interesting to me about this chart is that <laughs> if you look at the uh, lines that are clustered there at the bottom, it's not, it's not the poor that are doing the worst. It is actually the middle 60%, that dotted line. Uh, they are doing even worse than those at the very bottom and uh, closer to the top. And I should remind all of us that these uh, figures uh, are adjusted for the fact that people have already paid their taxes and they're adjusted for the fact that they get some government benefits which is the only reason why uh, the poor, by the way, the bottom 20% uh, look a little better than the middle class. So um, this really, I think, just makes your point rather sharply and clearly with the data. Um, would you like to say a little more about that? I know you've got some thoughts about whether the uh, CPI or other standard inflation measures are adequately portraying all of this. You know, Bell, as I, I, you and I chatted about this just before he opened up, and I was kind of looking at the chart, and I said to myself, well, you know, uh, you know some, when they look at the chart, could say, okay, uh, the top 1% are doing fantastically well, but the lower quartiles are not doing so badly either. Uh, uh, but in fact, this isn't the case. And it points to a central theme of the book. And that is, I mean, one thing that really came out in the book, in the symposium, <coughs> is just how flawed and misleading headline statistics are in America. Unemployment figures, GDP, and inflation figures are all flawed and misleading and have been misleading policy leaders for some time. Now, for example, we have unemployment, an unemployment index that counts people as employed even if they can't find full-time work and they want it, and even if the best they can find is below, materially below a poverty wage. So in other words, you say, well, they're, they're employed. Well, that doesn't tell you much in the unemployment statistics. You, you know, they can be basically not earning enough to feed their family or feed themselves. And that's a big deal, obviously. Now, furthermore, when you look at these numbers and they're CPI adjusted, you know, I think everybody in the video understands that CPI is a consumer price index. It's an index that's generally used by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, uh, I, I, you know, in, in sort of trying to give a sense of whether there's real increase in, in uh, uh, wages or not. But, but so these are CPI adjust, adjusted. But, but that doesn't tell us the story. Uh, we forget, and the CPI doesn't tell us, that for middle and lower income Americans, the basket of goods and services matter to them, that matters to them most to achieve the American dream is actually weighted differently. The, the basket of goods and services they care most about is different than uh, uh, the uh, basket of goods and services affluent people uh, do. That is, the goods and services that typically matter most for the American dream of the middle class, um, uh, you know, have to do with, you know, basics, healthcare, housing, tuition, so you can go to school and advance yourself, uh, so you can actually get a uh, sort of rising wage. Since I was a boy in York County, just listen to this. I was thinking about this just as <coughs> this morning. Healthcare, healthcare since the 1960s is up 23.4 times. That's not 23.4%, that's 23.4 times. Housing is up 11.7 times. Uh, that's, that's a middle Atlantic uh, region figure, not just York County. Now, even more importantly, tuition at Penn State. Penn State is an excellent university. It's the center of the state, State College, Pennsylvania. and um, uh, it's a land grant uh, college that was meant to be initially, and it was meant it's meant to be today, a school where lower and moderate income uh, kids can get an education for much less than the private school. So it's meant to give them a chance, a way out of out of poverty, way to the, seize the American dream. But tuition at Penn State has gone up 35.3 times what it was in the 1960s. You know, if you add in um, 
uh, uh, you know, living expenses, uh, housing and, uh, and uh, food. Uh, uh, it's, 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 it's almost $40,000 a student. Uh, now, when I was going to uh, school, I went to Haverford College, which was uh, a private school near Philadelphia. Uh, my dad was a country doctor and it was, was a stretch for him to pay $3,300 a year for, for tuition, room and board, the whole nine yards. That's not $40,000. So the CPI uh, is up 8.67 uh, uh, times what it was in 1960, all right. But, but the cost of healthcare is rising three times faster than the CPI. The cost of housing 1.5 times as fast as, faster than the CPI. And the cost of tuition is rising 4.5 times as fast as the CPI. And that is the heart of what matters to middle and lower income Americans in order to seize uh, the American dream. Now, my second takeaway from this, so, so this, this uh, we are, we, Gene, just to remind you, we are almost out of time and we, you might want to say something about solutions before we have to turn it over to the next panel. Yeah. Well, so that takeaway from the symposium, there's a clear consensus in the book. This is pedestrian, but everybody agreed. It's not about handouts. It's jobs, jobs, jobs. Yes. How we get those jobs and an enlightened American business is both discussed in granular detail in the book and more uh, will be in a second symposium I tend to, I, I wanna have. Now, uh, Bell, uh, in terms of, of suggestions in the book, my own areas of expertise are finance and regulatory effectiveness and efficiency. There are suggestions in there about that, but indeed, perhaps more important are suggestions in the book uh, uh, by others, uh, uh, about uh, all kinds of different solutions, uh, uh, infrastructure span, get us started, education so that people can take advantage uh, I, uh, you know, of, the, of the next generation of technology and how that affects local and, uh, and, and national needs. If, if you educate everybody in New Haven, Connecticut to the nines in high school, nobody's gonna be there in the next generation. So you gotta basically have a different kind of educational policy and uh, broader jo jobs opportunity trade policy. Insurance, interestingly enough, Bob Schiller has some brilliant thoughts in the book about uh, using insurance tools in new ways that can actually help put a floor under a whole bunch of different things for middle and low income America. So bottom line, read the book uh, uh, and come to the next symposium. Uh, and if there were more time, I'd go into all the intricate uh, you know, uh, things that have to be done. But in one sense, it's very intricate. In the other sense, it's, it's very easy. It is about jobs. Uh, and uh, you, you've asked, Val, you've asked me, so where are we gonna get the money to spend it? My, to spend on this? My answer is this is World War II level of need. And we always seem to come up with money or more easily come up with money when we're talking about um, uh, you know, upper income issues. Uh, we ought to come up with money to uh, fight this enormous problem for middle and low income Americans. And we ought to be doing that in a way that uh, uh, recognizes that for black Americans, the problem is worse, it is deeper, and while the Fed has done something recently of great importance in its policy shift to focus on full employment, uh, the Fed has got to be given more accurate numbers on how bad unemployment really is and recognize full employment is not about part-time poverty work, uh, but really full-time jobs with a living wage. And that's full-time jobs, not just for white Americans, but about all Americans. And with that said, uh, I, uh, I thank you. I hope everybody will read the book and come to the next symposium. And again, Bell, thank you and Brookings for an opportunity to discuss briefly uh, these important subjects. Uh, Gene, thank you for stimulating this conversation and writing this uh, book. Uh, and I'm very interested to hear your, you've got follow on activities planned. Uh, so I'm also glad you finished the conversation by mentioning the Federal Reserve's uh, new approach to monetary policy, which I suspect uh, the next panel might get into. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.